So our presentation is called Dark in the Night. We, and yeah, we, we are the night owls, so welcome. Okay, uh, can everybody see my screen? Okay, so we hope to apply to get a nocturnal preserve designation. So it's similar to a dark sky preserve, dark sky preserve, which you would find in Jasper. And with the nocturnal preserve, the biggest thing is that our dark skies are dark enough to support nocturnal wildlife. So nocturnal, that means animals that sleep during the day and are awake at night. And they like really, they like complete darkness at night uh, to do, uh, to live in, in their ecosystem. So this designation is given by the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. And with, whether we get the designation or not, we hope to do as much public outreach as possible. So public outreach, just different events that will lead at the, at the weasel head or different community groups um, to really teach people about the importance of dark skies and, to, and for wildlife, from birds to plants to bats, uh, a little bit of everything. And we hope that this will benefit animals in the long run, animals and plants, and also increase the community's enjoyment of the park as well. So not only will it protect animals, and we'll, we'll, we'll see a better opportunity of seeing nocturnal animals, but we'll also get a better night a vision of the sky. So hopefully more stars. So what will it take to get this designation? The center of the nocturnal preserve would be inside the Weasel Head and Glenmore Park Preservation Society. So that's the core zone. In the future, we hope to develop partnerships with neighboring communities um, to decrease light or to decrease light pollution in that area. So we call that light abatement and that's decreasing light pollution, which we'll get to more. And that'll be our buffer zones. So what's really important with um, our hope uh, with uh, applying in the future is a healthy relationship between the weasel head and communities. Uh, we also were gonna develop and offer ongoing nocturnal related programs uh, and programming and experiences. All right, just wanna make sure I'm not going too fast and if there's any questions. Okay, so these are some dark sky recordings that we took. Um, so we have to take the dark, the night sky quality readings when it's really, really, really dark. So the darkest period of the month. So that's around new moon. Uh, the blue, the blue line here, or no, let's start here. So we hope generally Calgary its light pollution is above average. So Calgary's light pollution is, is not great compared to other cities. So on the outside of the suburbs, you expect to have light pollution around 20. So the higher the reading, that means the lower the light pollution. And the units is, um, something arc second, it's, it's a, it's a long word. I'll, I'll talk about it later, but in, in terms of what we're looking at here, the higher the units, the better. Uh, so the less light pollution. So you can see 20. Um, this is generally what we expect at the edge of a suburbs. So around where the weasel head would be uh, of major cities. Uh, where we are right now, the blue line was taken uh, during in May. So that was when there's still snow on the ground. So when there's still, when there's still snow on the ground, it reflects up light. Our, more, our most accurate reading was taken in March with no snow on the ground. So we're looking at readings about between 18.5 and 19. So not quite at that 20 reading yet. Now uh, here at the fort, so this is the parking lot at the Weasel Head North Glamour Park. Uh, this is the floodplain. So you walk down that hill uh, right before the bridge. That's where this reading comes in. And then after you cross the Elbow River, there's a bunch of benches. So that's the first bench that you see, the second, the third, and the fourth. And the fourth, that would be around that beaver pond. Now there's the new ring road around the beaver pond. So with these recordings, I expected it, the light pollution to be worse. Um, but the thing is, is that our night sky readings, they take the sky. Uh, so it's, it's more the sky glow above. So we're really looking at an effort of communities in general, decreasing light pollution. And you can see that in these recordings. And we're hoping that um, if, we can make awesome individual and community-wide efforts 
that we'll get to something more around the 20 MPSS. Uh, ac acro sound, yeah, acro second, it's, yeah. So what is light pollution? So this is a picture of Calgary and you can see some, some wildlife corridors. So wildlife corridors are excellent places for animals to, um, to travel. So you can see that from here, animals can travel in a natural lake area. Uh, so this is Fish Creek Provincial Park. The weasel head would be here. I believe this is Nose Hill. Uh, but the thing with light pollution is that these, these wildlife corridors, they can become fragmented during the night just because light pollution is spilling out into these areas. So here you can see 22X and here as well, you can see McLeod Trail. Um, and then this is by the weasel head. This is pretty bright as well. Uh, so this is over the Glenmore Reservoir. So the weasel head would be here again. Uh, so we just wanna make sure that decreasing light pollution would make sure that these wildlife corridors are still as just as healthy during the night as they are during the day. Uh, so sometimes you get floodlights that shine into the park as well. So we are going to talk about light, what is light pollution next. I was muted, there we go. Um, well, light at night has always been present to some extent with the moon and the stars. What we are really concerned about is artificial light at night or Allen for short. Um, nocturnal animals adjust their behavior according to the amount of light on any one particular night. So for example, Predators will often be more active during the full moon as their prey is more easily revealed by the bright lighting. And prey species at those time periods will spend less time foraging and more time hiding. While evolutionary pressures related to everything from air composition, predator prey relationships, food availability, and climate have changed, the cycles of light and dark have largely remained constant. And so these changes are quite significant for the species experiencing them. Over a hundred years ago, before electricity, we only lit spaces with candles where it was really needed. Uh, now we light as we light near everything, right? We we light up spaces that aren't even being used sometimes. Um, this has allowed us to change our habits. It's allowed us to change uh, when we go to bed and work longer into the night, but it's impacting these nocturnal organisms um, quite significantly they, with new evolutionary pressures and challenges that they've never faced before. A change in these cycles of light and dark. So there are three main types of Allen or artificial light at night that we hope to address in this talk. Blue sky glow, light trespass, and glare. We'll start with sky glow. Sky glow is caused by the city lights that are unshielded and shine right up into the sky. So you could imagine a helicopter flying over the city at night and how many lights can they count? Um, or you can even take a, take a think back to that picture we just saw Zach uh, talking about with the um, NASA international, um, sorry, the International Space Station flying over top of Calgary. Um, that is how much light is spilling up into the sky. And that's light that really we don't, we're not using. What's that? All right. um, I can't turn off my screen and I think I'm still pinned and I don't think people can see you talking. Okay, there we go. Is that better? I think you're on Sarah now. Uh, we have there you go. We're good. Okay, we're good. Yeah. All right. Lovely. So um, if you've ever driven into the city of Calgary at nighttime, or any big city at night, you can often see this big glow or aura of light around the city as you approach it. Again, that's that sky glow. It impedes our ability to see the stars, uh, which would be astronomical light pollution. But it also contributes to a significant amount of wasted energy and wasted money. Um, next is light trespass. Light trespass is when lights from our property shines onto another property or a space not intended to be lit up. An issue that's easily corrected, and it's one we'll talk about how to fix, 
a little bit later on in the talk tonight. This one's nice and self-explanatory, and I think this image does an excellent job of it. And lastly, we have glare. So we do have two types of glare. Uh, glare from bright lights can often cause temporary disabilities uh, with our night vision. In animals that are more attuned to darker lighting, who have more sensitive vision, this disability glare or this temporary disability can have a much more significant impact on them. If you've ever been driving and had someone pass you on the highway who has their high beams on and they've got really bright high beams and you blink for a few seconds afterwards um, and you can't quite see the road, it's a perfect example of experiencing disability glare. So disability glare is our first type of glare where our vision is impaired, you blink and you still see the light, your eyes are still um, st trying to reset so they can respond to light again. Discomfort glare is almost a more extreme version of this where the light is suddenly so bright that your eyes hurt. Now, I don't recommend doing this, but if you happen to look at the sun for a moment, um, your eyes would hurt, and that would be the sensation of discomfort glare. You, the perfect example of how this might impact species is a deer in the headlights. But we'll talk a little bit more about how that impacts animals afterwards. But why are we interested in applying to become a nocturnal preserve? Well, we recognize the importance of nocturnal habitat and we want to share our knowledge and um, learn from other people who are also interested in this topic so that we can protect and continue to work on saving nocturnal, uh, the weasel head as a nocturnal habitat. We can take action and see positive outcomes right away. As light pollution, doesn't just influence our ability to see the stars, it has numerous consequences for nocturnal organisms. In this image here, I think this illustrates it very, very well. Um, this was from a massive power blackout that occurred in Toronto uh, or Ontario in 2003. It affected millions of people. And you can see in the before picture, stars were not visible at all. You've got that sky glow. And in that after picture, you can see the Milky Way. There were also instances, there was a really big power outage in New York, I think more than a decade ago now as well. And people were actually calling into police because they saw strange lights in the sky and they had never seen the stars before. So by working to um, protect nocturnal animals and nocturnal habitat, We'll also have this side effect of having better um, night skies to watch. So these seemingly small actions we can take to correct light pollution can have huge positive impacts in protecting and restoring uh, healthy nocturnal ecosystems. It's one of the easiest forms of pollution to, uh, to deal with um, because once you turn off that light, it takes very, very little time for those ecosystems to readjust back to the more natural light and dark cycles. So, so we'll talk a little bit more about how this impacts uh, organisms now. So one big thing that it disrupts is dispersal movements. And you can really see this with migratory birds and especially songbirds. So birds, they'll use natural lights. So the stars and the moon to migrate at night. And they didn't evolve with all the light that we have in our cities right now. Uh, so they get, they get distracted by those lights and they're very attracted to it. So birds are just as attractive, attracted to uh, changing their flight path and going towards city centers as insects are to swarming around the light at night. And this can be, this can be not great because birds can fly into, this is how birds fly into windows. So not just the big towers downtown, but also homes as well. Um, so one of the, um, and also when they're, the lights at night gets them to be disorientated and then they start calling out and this attracts other birds to the area as well. And so other, another way is that if lights point directly up in the sky, then birds will continually fly around it, kind of like insects. And this makes them really, really tired. Um, and they're unable to refuel after just because they spent all their energy doing that. 
So one of the, the biggest things we can do, and there are a lot of different organizations that have been doing this, is just turning off uh, specific lights uh, or turning off lights in the spring and the fall during those migration periods. Um, so if you have a light that's pointing directly up, you, you either turn off the light for the whole night or turn it off for periods just so that birds can reorient themselves and go back on onto their route. And it also leads to higher roadkill. So Dylan was talking about glare and a lot of nocturnal, a lot of animals, they have really good nocturnal vision. So they're really sensitive to letting in small amounts of light into their eyes. So if, a, so the way glare works is that when a car is coming towards a deer, even when it looks the other way, it still has that imprint and it doesn't know which direction to go. With all senses in mammals and us too, is, is the edge that's the most important. So when you smell a loaf of bread, when you start smelling it, that's when it's really, really powerful. But when you've been smelling it for a while, you can't smell it as much because you're used to that senses. So we're, we wanna minimize light pollution just so that we don't over stimulate uh, the, the herbivores and other animals because they really rely on that night vision for hunting, uh, for finding food or other, th other activities during the night. Uh, there's also another one. This is in the damselfly is like, uh, like a dragonfly. And I like talking about insects. Um, the UV will hit the, the pavement and it looks like water. And kind of like the birds flying around in the sky, uh, it, the damselflies can waste a lot of energy because they're heading towards this light on the pavement. And they're hoping they get a drink of water and to lay eggs. And it's just a waste of energy for them. It also disrupts biological clocks. And this can be seen with robins. They'll wake up earlier than they normally do. And this can make them exposed to more nocturnal predators than they would have otherwise. And the other thing, which I found really cool, was trees. So trees that are by lights, um, they still, as the days get shorter and shorter, they still think that the days are longer just because they're by that light source. And so they'll actually hold on to their leaves a lot longer than they normally would. And that's not great because trees need to lose their leaves to, to save water or to save, uh, to protect themselves from the cold weather and to store water, to save water. And it, this can also change uh, wind trees, flower and plants. And this, this isn't great because it can mix up the pollinators with the flowers because they've relied on each other for, for as long as they've been both been around. Uh, so yeah, so it also disrupts foraging behavior. So like Dylan was talking about, the moonlight is a natural source of light and a lot of animals will change their behavior during that time. So a deer mouse will spend more time hiding and less time feeding. And a short-eared owl will have a very productive hunting night. Now owls, they can't see in pitch darkness, but their pupils are so huge that they can let in tons and tons of, of small amounts of light. Um, that sounded like an oxymoron. Uh, so they, they can let in really, really tiny amounts of light and they do that really well. Uh, so when the moon is out, they become even better predators. Now the artificial light at night, that makes it seem like the moon is out every night. So now the herbivores and predators, they had to get used to the, like almost having the moon out for every night. So for foraging behavior, um, if we, when you go back to the, I'll do it really quickly. No, that's when you, going back to that picture with, with the light pollution and you saw the wildlife corridors in Calgary. So you saw Fish Creek Provincial Park was dark. You saw that Nose Hill was dark and you saw that the weasel head was dark. Trees are a really good way uh, to increase foraging behavior and protect um, protect environments from light pollution. So you can see that there wasn't any light coming from that spot and that's because the trees really filtered it out. So they are darker areas inside those corridors providing that lights don't shine in or they don't go through. All right now while light pollution is more easily solved than other forms of pollution. There you go. Um, once mitigation measures have been taken, it will take collaborative effort in order to make the weasel head as healthy of a nocturnal environment as possible and a more uh, enjoyable uh, nighttime experience for people as well. So 
in order to do that, we need your help. We, and we aim to do a number of different things. So we want to work with local community boards and community members and uh, stakeholders and our municipal government and establish some goals and benchmarks for light abatement action. And this is all what this is what we're dreaming of there. Uh, we want to work with the neighboring communities. Um, research and share ideas for affordable methods or fixes, uh, products for light abatement, work to understand what barriers there might be for businesses or individuals uh, or the government towards installing light abatement measures. Um, we want to create and present some educational and experiential events so that people can come out and enjoy uh, those nocturnal habitats and come to appreciate uh, nocturnal species. Um, as well as educate regarding the effects and solutions to light pollution. And finally, we want to work with people who are interested and different groups that are interested to expand the reach of this, uh, this topic and this environmental issue so that we can work together to help turn Calgary from something like this and this, where we can see a lot of sky glow. It looks like it's an overcast night, but we want to turn it to something like this. Now this, oh, oh right. there we go, yeah. Um, now this one is an edited photo, but this is the optimal possible outcome that we could end, uh, end up with. Uh, imagine being able to see the stars this clearly over our city. Um, let's change the next slide there. Perfect. But how do we actually go about reducing light pollution or applying light abatement? Well, there are four main things you can do to check in your home or your businesses and change if necessary to make it more nocturnal friendly. And you can see in this picture here as well, this is a small town um, that has done some really incredible light abatement. I can't uh, recall which one it was, but you can see there's no light spilling up from the community and the sky is incredibly clear up above it as well. Um, so the first thing we can do um, in reducing light abatement is using softer or warmer colored lights. So you can see the white blue spectrum is what we want to avoid here. And that red, orange, that warm light is much less harmful towards nocturnal species. The reason why this is is because um, that white shifted light, that blue light, that's closer to the ultraviolet spectrum. Um, and that's more similar to the type of lighting that the sun gives off, a broad spectrum, high UV radiation light. And so that is more uh, an imitation of daylight conditions as opposed to those really warm lights, which don't have the same UV impacts on organisms. Another thing that you can focus on or take a look at is the shielding of lighting around your home or business. So if the light is, isn't shielded at all, at all, you can see on that picture on the left there, the light is spilling out in all directions. So you're gonna get lots of instances of uh, glare and it's going to contribute to sky glow. As you begin to shield it more and more progressively, you end up with light shining directly on what you intend it to be shining on only. Um, and you can see that picture on the very right there. That's kind of the optimal lighting situation we're looking for. So this is making sure light is only shining where it's intended. And then we can also look at only having lights on when it's needed. So safety and security lighting is very important. However, you can install timed or motion sensitive lights and make sure that they are only lighting what is necessary again. When the lights aren't needed, you can turn them off. Or for things such as driveways, you could even consider using reflectors instead of lights. Now you can see um, a lot of instances where buildings are lit up for um, kind of decorative features. Um, and instances like that, you'd really want to take a look at it and see, is this light contributing to safety or security? Um, or is this unnecessary light? And you may even be able to reduce your uh, electrical bill this way too. So yeah, just some goals that we, we want to achieve with this project. And one of the big ones, as we mentioned, is developing that relationship with, with the surrounding communities. 
and it's it's working on the initiatives inside um and a lot of it is our re our own research so we're going to be researching places where you can get the best uh uh, light bulbs, nocturnal friendly light bulbs, nocturnal friendly fixtures, uh, motion sensor lightings. Um, but we also want to get to a point where uh, there's groups inside the communities that are leading the project as well. Um, and another goal is that we become a part of the larger nocturnal friendly community. Um, so there's, there's various communities inside and around Calgary. Um, as well as Canada and internationally that have worked on efforts like this. And a lot of it is collaborative work. Um, so there's, yeah, so we want to make sure that we're working with the community, with the local community and the broader community as well. And yeah, the, the best part is, is to have fun with this. And it, it's once we get that, once we get that light pollution down um, and we'll be able to see a lot more animals uh, we'll be able to see more stars as well and it'll just be a different a different experience than we had in the past um and yeah so calgary's light pollution is um a bit not not as great compared to other cities but this is a very very new topic and calgary has is is from yeah it's very invested in protecting the natural spaces uh it's it's been a great place to uh, experience natural places, whether from Fish Creek Provincial Park or Nose Hill or the Weasel Head. It's, it's been pretty awesome. So we hope just to continue to make a positive impact uh, on the local community, as well as the, the local ecosystem as well. And yes, yeah, so just keep that conversation going. All right, now it's not just us working on this, we need help from you. We are looking for community leaders and volunteers who want to participate with us. And as you'll see by this excellent next portion that Sarah will be running, um, we we love to have our volunteers work with us and they do some incredible things. So um, if you're interested in um, helping us or joining us or you have some ideas, please feel free to reach out. Um, Again, you can take action, look at your home or business lighting, and install light abatement measures where it's possible. Um, and you can come out to the weasel head, and whether on your own or with us or with another group, and learn more and enjoy those nocturnal environments. So mini minimizing light pollution, as we said earlier, is one of the easier uh, forms of pollution to clean up, but it takes a small effort and it has close to immediate positive um, outcomes. So uh, we hope you feel ready to jump on board with us 